I'm Erica Hollingsworth, and you're listening to the F1 Podcast. What's up, everybody? Andrew Clear here from the F1 Podcast, bringing you Season 4, Episode 11. Holy shit, Episode 11 already of the F1 Podcast. I am joined today by uh, Erica and John. How are you both doing today? Very good. I mean, the sun is out. Can't complain. Hockey in Toronto. Yeah. So, uh, but first, we get, before we talk about the Leafs, we got to talk about the Chinese Grand Prix. This weekend was quite interesting with the Chinese Grand Prix. It was our first sprint weekend of the year, first and foremost. So, also, Erica, how are you doing? I'm reliving the glory that was the first sprint weekend of the season as uh, so we're sitting here and uh, getting into it. It was um, exciting. Back to China for the first time since 2019. And also our first sprint race with some new rules and format compared to what we've seen in the last few years. So I'm vibing. It was a fun For weekend. sure. So let's dive right in. This weekend we had one free practice session, then we got into sprint format. Uh, you know, I always find it interesting. We haven't been to Shanghai since 2019 <laughs> and a lot of new drivers on the circuit, new cars. And to think that it was decided to be a sprint format weekend, I wonder if F1 just decided to want to go the chaos way. Um, so that, you know, teams didn't have a full chance to really be able to spec up their cars, which made it for some interesting racing over the weekend, uh, for sure. Uh, particularly in the sprint, there was raining that affected um, position, but probably the most controversial of the qualifying areas was Lando Norris getting a lap reinstated, um, which ended up being the pole position lap for the sprint qualifying. Uh, I think traditional rules, and it may be clear, on the broadcast was that the traditional rules are that if, if you go off the track and kind of lose your lap time and, you know, towards the end of the lap, it's then you get your second, your next lap kind of, you know, not qual not countered as well, because in theory, you're supposed to then have an advantage. Um, but that wasn't necessarily the case. So I can understand why the reinstatement came in and Lando was on fire in the wets there with, with the intermediate tires in that qualifying lap. This seemed to be a very big weekend for them. I think there, you know, there were concerns that they were going to keep up with the Red Bulls or the Ferraris, but, you know, I think Lando had like an exceptional weekend, not just sp we talk about the sprint, uh, we talk about the sprint performance, but it, going on to the race weekend, just like keeping himself uh, competitive, you know, he mastered those wet conditions to get on pole. He took second in a Grand Prix comfortably keeping the Red Bull of Paris at bay. Like, Definitely one of his most strongest races, probably his top three strongest races in his career so far. Yeah, it was nice to see him keep a, a pretty level head. I mean, to not start on the front row, but to relatively early in the race, find himself improving his position was exciting. I don't think he kept that same level headedness in the sprint race, which we saw off the start. Um, not a great way to kick off that first lap and really tried to be overly aggressive to make up for the poor start which ended up maybe costing him a little bit more than it would have to just grin and bear it and try to make up for it later on with you know an attack later in the sprint uh so to see him not make that same mistake and to have a little bit of a better start on sunday was refreshing i know we've seen this car bring some upgrades to it and it seems to be really panning out for them and uh, proving that, you know, with the with the right team in place and, you know, the forward momentum that they've had that we weren't sure they would bring, uh, it's, it's continuing to move in the right direction. Because honestly, when I saw that straight on this track, I thought McLaren was done for this weekend. And I'm pretty sure even the commentators talked about that at one point, how a lot of the teams, including McLaren, were very scared about those long straights. Yeah, and they were able to excel with their straight line speed. And from what I hear, there's going to be more updates coming in the near future for McLaren, which is then going to make it more scary. Um, I think they're going to be quite a competitive car and probably put Red Bull on their heels because, as mentioned, Lando had a stunning weekend. We'll just go into the sprint race, you know, overall quickly. I know Fernando did a great job starting third in the in the qualifying, um, you know, Lewis finishing second, thanks to the wet max had a tough one going P four, but he was able to get a nice jump start off the line and <laughs> he won the sprint ahead of both his teammate Sujar Perez and Lewis Hamilton, who did finish P two. So congrats to Lewis for doing so. But the fact that max was able to take over Lewis with 10 laps to go and then 
win by 13 seconds is ridiculous. In such a short amount of time to make up that territory and to get that kind of advantage when people aren't pitting either. So it's not like anyone came in and it kind of changed the nature of things and someone missed an overcut, whatever, is just bonkers. Do you find that the new, speaking on like the whole new sprint format, did you find that it was more enjoyable this weekend? I think for me that I like that idea where you don't have to pit unless there is like an actual issue with your car. You know, it gives that ability and, you know, we'll maybe we'll see a better circuit in terms of Miami. We'll just see if that actually plays out really well or differently. Truthfully, I'm not really a huge fan of sprint weekends overall because i just don't think as anything it kind of takes away from sometimes the quality of racing i do think though that i kind of like f2's way of where qualifying dictates your overall starting position and then you do the sprint race which i honestly like when they first started it i kind of liked how they did i liked how they dictated uh back in 2021 you know your sprint results then carried into your qualifying results so just it kind of carried on throughout. It did feel like a separate race as opposed to the GP was all interconnected. I think the problem that this sprint format has, and we may not see it, but there is a big risk, is that if you total your car in sprint racing, you are screwed for qualification on, on the GP, right? So I think drivers will maybe go a little bit more tentative, right? You know, for instance, Alonzo suffering collision damage on a puncture, right, with Sainz. You know, he ended up getting a 10 second penalty off. Obviously, I was heated at the time because I was heated at the time because I thought science created the collision. But I guess the stewards saw it differently. But with that said, if Fernando had, you know, any more damage to the car just than a puncture, that would have truly affected his rest of the weekend. Right. And that could be, you know, if it's like, say, a Max Verstappen or say this championship gets tight. And we have a collision like that where he had where he has an issue or a top runner has an issue and then they get screwed for the rest of the weekend. I, I think that's going to impact the sport negatively in that way. There's the risk of the snowball effect for all of it, right? Yeah. And I know they're going into qualifying earlier with less practice, less data under their belts, which can result in some funkiness going on in sprint qualifying, which is then potentially exacerbated because, you know, they're they're going into the car for the sprint race at the equivalent of what kind of would be what fp3 that's yeah like <laughs> it's a it's a lot less time to really analyze the grid and see how you're going to perform in that moment and to boot i i think it's a, a lot of time to really be putting these cars under stress so for if they keep this format when they go to like a new set of regulations on a car for that first season i'm a little concerned because you now have twice in one weekend where you're trying to pull the absolute fastest lap out of your car with less data and you've now got even more laps where you're trying to run in racing conditions. And I just worry about the reliability and the longevity. And I'm also kind of curious about what the impact is on the drivers from like a mental and a physical standpoint, because that's a lot of time to be like firing on all cylinders and paying attention to stuff like what are their cortisol levels and blood pressure like at the end of all of this after three days of working in racing and, you know, high performance conditions. Why do they pick China as the first sprint race? Um, and I, I think that is a bigger question. I wonder because they haven't raced there in five years. And you talk about the lack of training or not lack of training, but lack of testing time. And you go to a track that you have not raced on in five years. That's your first one. Like it really kind of goes to show that like, you know, it is that snowball effect. Like you really screw up if you really don't know the track. And then you want to hear my tinfoil slash conspiracy theory on this situation. Oh boy. So my tinfoil hat conspiracy theory comment on this is that the F1 is now seeing that the cars are now at a point where racing and Nico even Nico Hulkenberg even alluded to this, that the dirty air effect and the overall racing effect of these cars are going back towards 2020 in 20, 2019 and 2020, where, you know, it wasn't good quality racing. So they are trying to now implement these weird sprint formats to provide less data for teams to then be able to set up their cars so that there is more confusion or there's more changes on the grid then and it, it can create for those more variable like effects that then lead to different results. I mean, I guess. <laughs> Do a barrel roll. It didn't really change anything, but I'm just saying that that that, that is my tinfoil conspiracy theory prediction here's, right here. Here's my thing. 
if we still had Mazepin racing, do you think that would be a smart choice for anyone? <laughs> like, would have made it more exciting. We would have bended on both <laughs> both races at least. Sure, but like I I mean yeah, like if people don't have as much data to go on, not as much time to set up, change cars, do whatever. Of course, it's gonna impact the results, but I think it just means that maybe the solution lies elsewhere, <laughs> not in doing crazy stuff to your race weekend format. Seems like someone is treating the symptom and not the actual problem. Yeah, but that's that's F one's notorious for that, right? Oh, I know. Because they're just going into a new car regulation for twenty twenty six. So why change the problem? Why force teams to change the problem now and they can just treat the symptoms? for the next two years, and then they'll have the new car format back in 26. Ferrari needs to figure out what's going on with their drivers. Because um, we saw this in the sprint that kind of went over to the race, and this is obviously going to be a snowball effect. Um, you know, you had some tensions between, uh, was it, I think it was signs that put Leclerc off track, or, or Leclerc kind of bounced back, and then making the comment, don't want to speak about this publicly. Let's talk about this inside, even though that his radio, I think, was technically on. So everybody can hear it. You know, like fourth and fifth is normally used to be a good like kind of thing for Ferrari. But this clearly was not their weekend. They couldn't keep up with the Red Bulls, the McLarens. They tried. It wasn't not even possible. But I think the bigger story is like they need to sit both the drivers down. and Just like, listen, I get one is staying here. The other one's leaving. But you want to have a good season you kind of need to figure this out yeah it's one of those where having a team because as much as ferrari has kind of played the team game before there still is typically like a standout one and two that hasn't really been well established this season i mean i know many of us expect leclerc but we did see team orders in one of the races where they let signs through so it kind of like it probably hasn't been something they've discussed in enough detail to avoid situations like that from transpiring on the track. So that was a little bit, I think, surprising and off-putting for a lot of people who, as spectators, would probably have a pretty clear understanding of what we would think that the team orders would be for them. But Ferrari is doing its Ferrari thing, and our wee little Frenchman, Fred Visser, needs to maybe bring down the hammer and make some calls there. They did move up Grizz positions, though. They started P6, P7 at the race, but finished P4, P5, respectively. I, I, th I think, though, like, Lando had a fantastic weekend, and he wasn't going to be beat. I think he was going to be – he wasn't going to be beat by Ferrari. But I think Ferrari then maximized their points overall from what they could get with that considered. Because you could, like – this was the first moment of kind of, like, them complaining about this on the radio – you hope, and especially how tight of a track Miami is, there could be there could potentially be a collision. And look, we saw some collisions this weekend that literally some drivers were at fault. <laughs> Despite one of them thinking it was not at fault. You lose. Do we want to fast forward and talk about the race then? Because Lord, I got some opinions on that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, for the race, we had um, at the beginning. Fernando Alonso made an incredible move around Sergio Perez in the Red Bull, where he was able to slide into second place, which then kind of effectively ended the race because Max was able to pull ahead with, you know, Alonso trying to maintain that P2 position. Uh, but then Perez was able to soon create, uh, regain the position, even though after brief contact, uh, or not, sorry, sorry, you know, after that all overall came into play, uh, there was some contact in kind of that initial spot with like, Hulkenberg and Lance Stroll, who later on had some other issues um, that we'll dive into. And then uh, Alpin and Gasly had some collision parts. But, you know, within the first at the at the beginning of like lap nine, when they did their first pit stops, Pierre Gasly pulled away from the box sooner than he should have when he had all four tires on, causing an engineer to fall over. And we haven't seen like injuries, you know, recently in kind of that side. But luckily, he was OK. Uh, they were fined for 10,000 euros, I think, after the race for unsafe uh, procedures. But when Max made a stop, Lando stayed out and kind of like hoping maybe he could maintain that pace. But the Red Bull was just way too quick this weekend. Like you can tell, even though there has not been a race in China for five years, the fans even know that Sauber has had bad pit stops all season. And they had, I think, reasonable pit stops this year. Like, fans were going crazy celebrating the fact that Sauber had a good pit stop. I said this before when they had not the best, but, like, just one that wasn't 35 seconds. It was like, congrats, guys. You did the bare minimum. 
so proud of you that you are meeting baseline expectations. If you worked in corporate America, you'd get a 2% raise. Congrats. Good job. Now, I think what also we need to talk about too is just general F1 procedure because two laps later on F1, Valtteri, or in, in, lap, in lap 11, Valtteri, um, his car is kind of, you know, his engine halted out, right? And he was kind of in a dangerous position on the track. And they just, they kept waving double yellows for the longest time. And marshals were still, were then on the track when the double wave yellow was going on, which finally then they said, oh, let's do a VSC, yeah. um, which then ended up transitioning into a full safety car period because they just could, because Valtteri's car was stuck in kind of like the gear and they couldn't move it. But don't you think, when when a, when a car is in that position, I understand they want to keep racing. Just throw the VSC right out of the gate, especially if marshals are going to have to go onto the track to help support Valtteri move his car. I can understand maybe not pulling the trigger immediately because you're hoping he can get it into neutral or maybe pull himself off track. But like it was clear that that car just died. That's that's a I think you could just hear it like that's a power unit dying on you. Your car's toast. You're not going to be able to fire that back up, get a little bit more more momentum in it, like we saw with some of the drivers in qualifying when they would spin out and stuff. Quite frankly, like, you give it about 30 seconds to watch a replay, and then you go, ah, yes, we should pull out the VSC now, not wait all of this additional time. And I think I think the rule is, is the minute that the marshals touch the car, then it's, then they can, then they're officially, that driver's officially out of the race, if I'm not mistaken. Honestly, I think they should make the rules that as soon as the marshal is on the track, for that kind of incident <laughs> no it should be it should be an immediate vsc i don't yeah. care if it's double it should be an immediate vsc is the second one of them's on the track and then you know should they be on it for a longer period like a minute then i would throw a full safety car in because that created then a lot of confusion in pit strategies um which you know yes. people suffered like guan yu Zhou had to suffer from a slow stop because of the unsure of well you know outside of sour being terrible but unsure of whether or not the vsc would then transition to an sc and like that much time was lost to boot it's also like a safety thing if you have people running around on the track not in a car like it's one thing because a driver if they can't get the car off themselves is gonna like get out and run away but as soon as you have people coming out to do anything else quite frankly i think just like hey abundance of caution let's not put anyone in a position where they're gonna get smoked that might be a fun consideration for for them to put in in future states and especially like they were working on that in a while they could not get that car into yeah, here my apologies that was lap 19 where the incident happened but then we had seven laps of a safety car slash vsc where i think the safety car went i think it could have it could have ended one lap sooner i mean even all the racers were even all the drivers saying okay why are we even waiting for the safety car to kind of you know keep going so <laughs> then we get to the juicy part of <laughs> the oh, race. Boy, hold on. Or, even, or or even that like couldn't you just red flag it and not waste all those laps and then just have a jump start like, i think there's just... i think there's slightly more specific rules around what constitutes red flagging a session probably debris I, and stuff like that it, it, it's, if it's not in a safe position where they debris can position if barriers have been harmed in any way shape or form that need to be rebuilt and i think it, it sucks because we did lose so many laps, but we've had that happen before when drivers have crashed out that it's just been a VSC. I mean, like if we even think back to Abu Dhabi in 2021, and that's kind of how a lot of that went down. So it's it's not ideal, but I don't think there was enough, you know, wreckage. And I think they did think they were going to rectify it a little faster than they did because that car was stuck for a hot man. But then everyone was trying to get ready to go again yeah lap 26 everyone tried to get going again fernando unfortunately kind of locked up going into turn 14 uh which created a concertina effect and we saw two collisions one kind of being minor with yuki sonoda getting spun around by k mag but the crash of the weekend lance stroll not paying attention at all to the cars in front of him and literally just ramming into the back of Daniel Ricciardo, who was poised to have finished potentially the points this weekend um, and needed those points um, first and foremost, which then, you know, kind of then created a effect where he then hit into Oscar's car, um, which then affected his diffuser and affected his overall race. Right. And unfortunately then uh, Danny Ricciardo had to uh, retire from the race with the collision damage. 
But the sheer audacity of Lance Stroll to not take any responsibility for the crash, despite the fact that the onboard camera shows that he is clearly not looking at all in front of him. He's looking to the apex to determine where to turn it on and get the race going uh, is quite embarrassing. And, you know, daddy's money can only speak for so much. You need to learn how to take responsibility and not create many enemies on the track as well. The way that he approached that press conference. And then when you hear, like saw Daniels, like Ricardo's, you could tell that <laughs> he was fuming <laughs> trying to keep himself composed. Uh, yeah, that was just, that was some real dumb driving there. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, like Daniel, when he says it, he's like, oh, I had just uh, calmed down, but all right, we're going to do this kind of in the interview. <laughs> yeah, like no, no ownership for it. And everyone's like, oh, well, everyone suddenly braked. Something was bound to happen. I think Oscar summed it up best with his comment. You know, everyone suddenly braked and Piastri goes, yeah, but everyone else didn't crash into one another. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the direct quote from Daniel Ricardo on Lance Stroll driving the back of them. Oh, we love quote. it, Andrew. Apparently, I'm an idiot, and it was my fault. That made my blood boil. The only thing you've got to do is watch the car in front, which he then if he mentioned about looking on the onboard, he clearly is looking at the apex of the corner and not at the car in front of him. I'm doing my best not to say what I want to say, but fuck that guy, <laughs> and I'm being nice too, but if that's what he thinks... <laughs> <laughs> Some of my favorite comments on Reddit. You always have to expect it in this type of curve. Easy now, Oscar. Lance only has like eight years in F1. He's not as experienced as you yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they suddenly break to avoid crashing into the car in front. Something Lance seemingly can't do. <laughs> Just You lose. Because if you think about it, this isn't the first time he has not paid attention to his mirrors or what's going on on track and crash into another car. Like if we think of Circuit of the Americas in what, 2021 or 2022 mm -hmm. when Alonzo was still racing with Alpine and oh, yes. they had that crazy crash. And you could tell when you watch the onboard and the replay that Lance was not using his mirrors and he was not paying attention to what was going on in the track. And he was being stupid and doing yeah. stuff that you aren't supposed to be doing in the particular situation in which he found himself, which is a repeat of what happened this weekend. And he's got more years of experience under his belt now. I get, I know he talked about picking up tennis last year, and I really just think it would be better for everyone if he did. Get to learn tennis, buddy. Well, maybe pickleball. Or paddle. Like, uh, also, uh, just a couple of things that I wanted to just really quick, quickly talk about. Uh, Alex Albon making the comment that he was in the Alpine sandwich or the Alpine baguette. Yes! I thought that was... <laughs> <laughs> and no one and no one picked up on it which was so sad <laughs> he was so proud of himself he just had this like cheeky little grin on his face absolutely chuffed just like waiting and the crickets are so loud <laughs> during that moment um and i think you know for the first probably positive race ish question mark um for alpine you know they came via oscar um sorry not oscar um Esteban Alcon came 11. Uh, I think they brought a new floor to Shanghai and, you know, they're slowly clawing their way back, but I guess time will tell in the midfield. Um, but I think that was their closest chance of getting points. I want to commend Lewis Hamilton. He didn't have a very strong car in the race, but he was able to go from P18 after a poor qualifying session to P9 scoring points uh fernando p3 disappointing finish p7 got i have no idea what the hell aston martin thought it was a good idea to put the soft tires on for like 26 laps you know if they try to concerted effort to try and overtake and then do another stop it just didn't make sense at the time you're running p3 throw the same tires on let that guy run he knows how to compete he can he, he knows how to figure out a way to find tents in that car that you know Clearly, anyone, you know, Lance Stroll cannot. And it just screwed up his whole strategy for the weekend. And it was just, as a fan, it was very frustrating for them to determine why putting on the soft tires. It was a gamble that was unnecessary. And they'd also seen earlier in the race that the tires weren't holding up super well. Like a lot of folks who started on those softs had to pit early. Oh, Hamilton hated them. It was, and with more track evolution, it's going to be warmer. You, you just know that you're probably going to get as bad if not worse level of dag at that point during the race like it's it's a choice one makes it yeah. is a choice um yeah but 
you know, classification that went out, Max Verstappen wins again, P1. Linda Norris, P2, his first podium, another podium without a win in F1, but hopefully that'll change soon. Uh, He's Checo. got such a chip on his shoulder about it now, and he was hoping he'd win Good. that sprint so he could at least be tied with Oscar. Good, but you know what? I, I'm happy that he's got that chip on his shoulder because now, I, to me, it's like, let's go. You know, yeah. I, I think like, you know, the, the, tall, the talk has been, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk. It's time to now put the walking to the to the test now. Charles finishing P4, Carl Sainz finishing P5, Russell P6, Alonzo P7, Piastri P8, unfortunately with the damage, it could have been a lot higher, Hamilton P9, and of course, Nico Hulkenberg, P10 for Haas, Woo! who have scored four points finishes now of five races in a season last year, where they only scored four points, only really had four points finishes last year total. Wow. That's, you know what I got to say, as much as I don't necessarily think the management and everything over at Haas is doing all that well, Nico's put in the effort and it's paid off. Like he's dragging that car as yeah. hard as he can and, to and that prop, P10 spot. And props to Io, man. He is, you know, I think we're starting to see with these, you know, less with these smaller budgeted teams like a Williams, you know, like Haas, it's better to have an engineer focus, engineer centric leader at the helm who can find ways to then, you know, cut costs, but also make it more, you know, make the car as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, that's just not what Hunter, what, what, what Gunther Steiner brought to the table um, in his position at Haas. And I think, although we do miss him, the change is starting to look like it was necessary and it was panning out um, for sure. But I also want to talk about, sorry, Zhou Guan Yu. Really emotional um, ending for him. I know he finished P14 and people were ripping on him in online and Twitter, but it, it was such an emotional weekend for him. First being, you know, the first Chinese driver, I believe in F1 history. You know, this was a track he's been at since he was four years old, watching his idols drive. And now that he was able to, you know, compete in Shanghai in front of his home crowd, it was really special, and he deserved that um, moment, I think, in my opinion, because it was monumentous. I agree. There were so many people who were, you know, making the equivalent of the meme where the guy is, like, pouring champagne and biting his medal and, like, kissing the girl only to be on, like, the third step of the podium or further down. But this is a big deal, and you could just feel it all weekend. Like, even in qualifying and stuff, any time one of the Saubers went by, everyone was screaming. And we've never seen that kind of support for that team. Lots of green and black in the stands. Lots of people just super excited to, to be there. And, you know, it's for anyone to be like, he shouldn't get that moment unless he's on the podium. I'm sorry, but do you honestly think that a Sauber is going to have a shot at something like that? Like, let the guy have a special moment. This is big, not just for him, but for the country, for crying out loud. And it's also a country that hasn't seen a race in five years. Like, And with, and with everything that they've kind of gone through since COVID. Yeah, well. and there's also so many other little things we celebrate drivers for in F1. Like, why not do something like this, too? Heck, when the sprint races started a few years ago, people were equating it to participation trophies. They're like, okay, you got some points in a sprint, but this is like participation trophy points. They don't actually count for anything. Well, guess what? Sometimes it's nice to just have a little bit of recognition, dude, and know that you still made it to the pinnacle of sport. To hear him talk about it when he didn't have a manufacturer behind him and how difficult that makes it to get to F1, like... Yeah, he comes from a well-to-do family with sponsors and stuff, but that doesn't mean this was just handed to him. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And he's a quality racer, right? Yeah. He, he's got good race craft, and he's just in an unfortunate situation right now at Sauber where they just can't provide him a car that is competitive. Uh, you know, I think if he was, say, at a Williams or an Alp, maybe, maybe an RB, I think even Haas, I think he would push that car into really good limits there. But it's funny you mentioned um, participation points because I think this oh is a good week to transition into the <laughs> week that was. And um, this was alluded to on the broadcast where the FIA and or the F1 is starting to look at, is going to meet with the owners of making adjustments to the points classification system right now in the race so that 
uh, we keep the point system from 10, 1 to 9. So 25, 18, 15, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, respectively from P1 to P9. One point for fastest slap. But uh, instead of P10 only scoring one point, um, oh, sorry, P9 would have four points in this case. Um, it looks like P10 would then end up going up to three points, adjustments made up above. And then P11 would get two points and P12 would get one point. Where then Crofty had this wonderful idea, Erica, that if every driver finishes, they should get a participation point pretty much. <laughs> Um, what are your overall thoughts on this situation slash potential change? Listen, I grew up in a generation where participation ribbons and trophies were a thing until you were like eight or 10. And then they went, you yeah. know what? There's actually some skill involved in what you're doing. You had enough time to revel in it. Time to see if you are actually good at this. If you're an adult and you're racing an F1, I don't think you need participation points. I think it's a slap in the face to the people who work really hard to make this happen, to give everyone a point just for finishing and for trying, especially when reliability in cars these days is not what it was. Like it used to be so common for cars not to be able to finish races. Guess what? That's not really the case anymore unless something catastrophic happens and we have a racing incident. And to boot, just, 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 why? Of all the things people are asking for out of this sport, this is not one of them. This is, this is, this is a no, no. Yeah, this is a massive, like, if, if I was Randy Jackson, it's a no from me, dog. Because <laughs> this is unbelievable in terms of you're affecting the prestige of racing, right? Half the grid gets points in a race. You want more than half the grid to get points for a race? That's the whole prestige is about, right? Finishing in the top 10. And, you know, that's where the, the midfield battles are so much fun to watch. P11, P10. And, yeah, there is that anguish if you finish P11 because you, you, you missed out on the points. Like, the where does it I'm stop? And this is it. The one thing that I now want to know is because currently you have to finish P10 in order to qualify to get the point for fastest lap. Does that now drop down to P12? Because if you're going to get a point, why can't you get an extra point for fastest lap? Not that I think anyone in P12 is really going to surprise us, but we have seen it where like, say something happens and a Red Bull falls to the back of the grid, you know, then they're, they'll set a fastest lap later just to take it away from someone else. They don't want to let more teams in. So if they let more teams in, like we, if we had Andretti coming in, if we had, you know, Audi coming in as a new team as opposed to taking over for someone there, and suddenly we have 24, 26, 28 drivers, something like that, I would be understanding of it because there's so many people out there, it's really hard to vie for only the top 10 spots. Yeah, I think but like 50% would probably be the magic number, right? 50% exactly. of the grid should then be able to have a chance to score points. But I just... I don't know. I like, are the people in charge now, the people who put the participation medals in, in the first place? Cause yeah. this is feeling very 1990s about everything. No, I think those it's one... really, it's feeling very white middle-class suburb in the nineties. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think the one change would be kind of interesting though, is if they got rid of the top 10 requirement for fastest lap, because it would be kind of cool to see teams in like the lower midfield, try and, you know, fight for that fastest lap point and take it away and be able to then dictate it um, throughout, you know, make those kind of adjustments uh, within the, you know, because it, it might create some more excitement towards the end of the race with multiple teams trying to go for that fastest lap to help fight for that midfield battle. So maybe that's something to take a look at, but I, I don't, back in the day, you used to, it, it was, it was harder. You could only top eight would score points. Now we go to top 10 um, and the grids were bigger back then, right? You know, we to, now the grids are shortening to 20. So just to think that you want to have more people going, this is kind of like overall in terms of North American sports where um, more teams now make the playoffs in like baseball and yeah. football. Uh, hockey hasn't changed, actually got worse and basketball. But, you know, those kind of major, you know, pro sports have now introduced more teams in the playoffs. But that's from a revenue perspective. Exactly. What, what does this have to do with anything in terms of like maybe there's some revenue in terms of the changing of the drivers um, for winning prize money at the end of the year. But it has like 
but it's not going to bring in more viewership. It's not going exactly. to be more ticket sales or anything like that. It's not. And I, it's not like this is really going to garner more merch because like, yeah, sure. Some teams might score more, more points, but I don't know that it's really going to like affect the standings. Cause it's not that insane of a change that they're making to anything. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it. I don't, care. I don't, am I a boomer in saying this? Maybe, but I'll be a boomer. And that's the case because quite frankly, it's just, it's just, you know, we're in a day and age where it's easier for people now to gain garner success um everybody's we're in a you know this is kind of like life a lot of people are handed things <laughs> i've been handed things a lot right time to it's to you have to earn it exactly. that's what the top 10 is all about earning your position and if you don't earn it do better exactly get off my lawn and leave my point system alone and crofty that's kind of i love you as a broadcaster do not think of this ever again <laughs> i swear it's one, one of the most eye-opening things I've ever heard you say. I just... Well, and then the second note, big news that came out today, is that uh, Scruderier Ferrari is no longer the just the team name. There is now a sponsor to Scruderier Ferrari. and There is now a new title sponsor for the team, correct? Scruderier Ferrari HP? Hewlett & Packard, coming in. I mean, if you've seen the threads of what they look like with the HP logo on the uh, driver threads, it looks so out of place. It um, it's similar to my feelings about many things today. Um, it's it's a choice. It's a choice. It kind of so because they've got the two right. They've got the one <laughs> yeah. on the right shoulder and the one in the stomach. It kind of makes me think about, like, if you had any toys as a kid where someone was wearing, like, a really crummy astronaut suit and mm -hmm. there were, like, fake buttons on the front panel of the <laughs> astronaut suit. Because <laughs> you got, you know, blue HP, yellow shell, and then another blue HP thing. And it kind of looks like, I'm an astronaut. And then you would just start pressing buttons and <laughs> make it sound like you're going off into space. And so that that's how I feel about it, if anyone cares to know. I just think, like... Just so used to seeing Ferrari in red and, you know, like, you know, tones that with regards to like yellow, gold, black, white, just blue does not sit well. It just does not look good on, on the threads. From what I hear is that uh, in Miami, rumor has is that they're going to celebrate this new title sponsorship with an all blue livery, too. I'm not going to lie. I've I've seen some preview photos of it. It kind of looks like a Pepsi can. <laughs> caffeine for your straight up caffeine. Are we going? Oh, straight up caffeine. It's like a similar color of blue with a uh, red and white kind of striping on it. As if, you know, when you see the commercial, there's the little ball swirling and then there's oh the gosh. Pepsi logo. I mean, which few things scream America quite like a cola beverage. So... <laughs> I mean, it is on brand, I suppose. But uh, I also have to laugh because the plain blue garb that they've got, the jackets I don't mind, but the button-up just looks like a bowling shirt to me. It really <laughs> just looks like a bowling shirt. Like, Leclerc looks like he's about to go full turkey on this and just, like, call it a day and have a cool one with the boys after. <laughs> uh, my favorite memes of today from, that, from this news came out. One, you know, how HP is going to provide them enhanced printing capabilities and how that's required for, you know, how many plans that they have at Ferrari during a race. They'll be able to print out plans A through H oh, at no. this point. <laughs> and that um, the best one was the Toto meme of I have it printed. I printed it out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the best one for every strategy, you know. At least Toto should go to Ferrari and be like, I printed, I printed it out for that case. Oh, that's too good. Well, we'll see how it goes. But of all of the special livery designs that I've seen for some of these races, it's it's not my favorite. Nope, but uh, we will be back, though. Thank you so much, Erica, for this week. And John, I uh, appreciate um, the, you know, the review of the Chinese Grand Prix. We will be back, you know, this coming week for a preview of the Miami GP, which is on Sunday, May 5th. Mm -hmm. um, but just want to get some, I just want to provide some updates as well. Erica, John, and I will be at the F1 exhibition in Toronto on May 2nd in the afternoon, yeah. around 435. 
Um, so please go get your tickets. It should be an exciting event. Um, you know, we're excited to meet our fans that are out there as well. Trinity Common, we will be there on May 5th. We are, we are celebrating that the fact that the races are coming back to normal timings for us in North America by attending um, the, you know, by going to Trinity Common. I think we have already about 14 locked Yeah, we've in. already, we've already got a good sized group going out. I think we have for our little area, six more spots already oh, awesome. like to, to fill out. Um, so if you want to come, if you haven't already DM'd us on Instagram, if you'd like to sit with us. Um, I don't want to pull a mean girls and say you can't sit with us if we run out of space. So please let us know if you'll be stopping by. We'll be showing up around 3.30. But if you have a larger group of people, you want to do your own thing, you want to like say hi, but go have like a quiet bevy in a corner by yourself, feel free to reach out to Trinity Common directly as well. Um, so they are Trini info at trinitycommon.ca or you can call them at 647-346-3030 to book a table for yourself and maybe some other peeps who are coming around. But if you would like to be with us and be part of the cool kids. Meh. I wish <laughs> I could be like yeah. the cool, cool kids. kids. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, perfect. Yeah. Uh, check. So feel free to see, show us a DM for Trinity Commons on May 5th. Uh, but with that said, again, Erica and John, thank you so much um, for this week. Uh, we will be coming back next week with season four, episode 12. But in the meantime, please follow us on Instagram, on at TikTok at F1.podcast. Please follow us at um, where you get your podcasts on at Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. We look forward to speaking with you next week to provide a preview of the Miami GP, which is another sprint format. So let's see what the Miami Gardens has entailed for us coming in a couple weeks. Hope everyone has a wonderful day and take care. Bye.